I'm Sasha Nicole. And I'm Star. And I'm Dr. T. And this is American Therapy, the definitive podcast on all things Black mental health. We are back for our second virtual show, so bear with us. Any uh, technical difficulties that you may see, you know, we are doing some things differently with the COVID-19 going on, but we're still super excited to be back in our virtual studio and doing all the fabulous topics and guests that we have. And so today, Star, what are we covering? Okay, so today is Global Autism Awareness Day. I probably messed that up, but I believe that's the name of the day. And so we're talking all things autism in the Black community, things that we don't talk about at home. Absolutely. So we're going to get on into it with our guest for today. We have none other than Ms. Latanya Ward, who is the president of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated, Row Ada Zeta Chapter in Anne Arundel County, Maryland. In addition to holding this office, Ms. Ward also serves as the State of Maryland Social Action Director and the Atlantic Region Autism Awareness Coordinator for Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. She holds a BA in Political Science from Michigan State University, a MA in Legal and Ethical Studies from the University of Baltimore, and she has a Graduate Certificate in Legislative Studies from Georgetown University. Ms. Ward was recently selected to serve as an advocacy ambassador in the state of Maryland by Autism Speaks. And in this role, she still is working with federal level legislators to effectuate change and awareness through education and sharing personal experiences as a caregiver, caregiver excuse me, of a child on the autism spectrum. Ms. Ward is the mom of a teen son, Miles, who was diagnosed with autism at age five. And in between juggling tutors, eighth grade homework, IEP meetings, Zeta and work, she and her son enjoy traveling, watching the latest Disney movies, and talking about wrestling. There's never a dull moment in the Ward household. <laughs> And then also we have guest number two. <clears throat> we have none other than, why didn't I have that already pulled up? Y'all bear with me. Miss Maria Davis Pierre. She's the founder and CEO of Autism in Black Inc located in West Palm Beach, Florida. This organization aims to bring awareness to autism spectrum disorder and reduce the stigma associated with the diagnosis in the black community. She's a licensed mental health therapist and Maria primarily works with parents to provide support through education and advocacy training. Her passion for working in the field stems from her personal journey with ASD when her daughter received the diagnosis at a very early age. In addition to therapy, Maria dons many other titles, including coach, speaker, advocate, and author. Her first published work, The Self-Care Affirmation Journal, is currently available for purchase on Amazon. Maria's unique approach to coaching and counseling exemplifies her drive and motivation toward greater acceptance and overcoming the barriers and personal struggles associated with raising a child on the spectrum. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Ooh, ooh, this is a we big one. To have you all. Yeah, this is a, a incredible guest panel. Like you guys are going to really bring the heat with all of your wealth of knowledge and experience. So what is autism? Because I feel like I hear everybody tell me now that they have an autistic child. <laughs> and I've seen like kids that I'm like, okay, you have autism. And then I, I mean, you know, I'm just, I don't have any kids. So I'm, you know. <laughs> People without kids, we are very judgmental. And then I see other people, and I'm like, your kid is, is, I'm like, don't seem like anything is different. So what is autism? Um, I'll, I'll take a, a stab at that. Well, um, for one, you can't uh, know autism by looking at somebody. So by um, looking at my daughter or looking at somebody else's child, you wouldn't be able to know if they were autistic or not. Um, so autism is a neurodevelopmental um, diagnosis. So it affects, or ha I try to make sure that my terminology is respectful to those who are actually autistic. Um, so I'm still learning that as well. Um, so um, it happens in the brain. Mm -hmm. So some of the um, symptomology that we use in the healthcare professional world that you would see would be um, repetitive behaviors, uh, which would be called stimming. My daughter likes to flap her hand. She likes to spin in circles. Those are things that um, make her happy and that's how she copes with um, being overstimulated which is something else that you may notice. Uh, you, people tend to think that children or um, those who are autistic are having um, meltdowns when they are actually overstimulated by uh, uh, things that they smell, 
um, lights, sounds, things that they feel. Uh, there's also the um, communication difficulties. Uh, so with autism, I like to say that I can have a conversation with a child and they can tell me every single thing about any kind of dinosaur, but mm -hmm. at the same time, they may have uh, trouble tying their shoe. They may not be able to do that. Um, so those are just some of the, um, the characteristics. Of course, you know, people also like to talk about the um, not looking people directly in the eye. For me, that's something that I don't get too caught up in uh, because I'm neurotypical and I don't care to look people in the eye. <laughs> so for that, um, I really uh, don't care to think that that is one of uh, the symptomologies because we also have to take culture into consideration when we are thinking about symptomology because in some cultures, you're not supposed to look directly in the eye. So those are, you know, just some of the things that you can wa watch out for. Of course, if all, also if they're not meeting developmental milestones. Um, my daughter um, was diagnosed at a very early age. Um, so she got the official diagnosis at 18 months. Um, and what kind of spearheaded me to make sure to get her the diagnosis was that she regressed in her speech. So she was saying mama, dad, dad, ball, all of those things. And then around 10 months, it's like she completely forgot how to say those things. Mm -hmm. um, I would begin to try to get her to repeat that. It was like she couldn't. Um, she had a slow res response time, so much so that I thought she was deaf. Um, so things would, mm -hmm. uh, you know, crash down around her and she would just have a super slow response time to it. So those are just some of the things. Yeah, I would say, let me, that the kind of, there's tons of different symptoms and they can present in a variety of different ways, but they tend to fall in two big categories. And one is trouble with social and or communication. And um, you just described a bunch of those where they could have um, trouble looking at people, trouble understanding. You can have children who are very, very bright, but they don't get kind of normal social interaction. And I've seen children really be bullied and ostracized because they just don't pick up normal social cues. And so that's, that's one of those almost invisible signs or symptoms of autism that's hard for people to see, but they really struggle with social interaction and or communication. So they could use words funny, they could not use words at all, uh, uh, any kind of variety of, of things. And then the second major category you also mentioned is kind of the restricted or repetitive behaviors. They may have very limited interest and talk about one thing exclusively. Um, even when someone is trying to talk about something else, they go right back to the thing that they want to talk about. Um, they could have uh, trouble with certain foods, the textures of the food, the taste of the food, the smell of the food and they have a very limited diet and it can be very hard to get adequate nutrition in some children. So kind of the two main categories of symptoms fall under that social and communication or the restrictive and repetitive behaviors um, that could look like the hand flapping, it could look like eating certain foods, it could look like lining up your toys a certain way, it could, could look like a bunch of things, but if you think of really big broad categories, that's what I would kind of label them as. You ladies definitely have hit on several of the things that I've experienced. Um, my son is 13, um, so I'm a, an expert all of 13 years of being a parent. And maybe since he was diagnosed at five, but I knew at 17 months something was not quite right. And it just took me a long time. I'm in that category where it took, took a long time to figure out what was going on, even though I knew something was going on. Um, and I say that, hey, I knew what was going on and the, the doctors and the teachers and everyone else just caught up. Mm -hmm. So everything that you just named are, is, is in some way, shape or form, we went through all of it, the, the stemming. So here's our, and these, I have a straw. I have these things all over the house. So, and we have to clean these things. It's like, hey, you wipe them off, you know, with this whole COVID thing, because he takes them everywhere. That's his, his thing. And we went through, pencils and crayons and so now the the thing is the straws and um the conversation um i like to equate talking to my son as not quite being on the radio station 
you know, it's, he hears and he speaks some things and it just goes off a little bit. And even when he was learning how to speak, I, I was listening to what, um, Maria, what you were saying about your daughter um, regressing. We went through that. So at two or three, he was saying, you know, words and kind of speaking in short sentences, but you couldn't quite understand what he was saying. He would be speaking and he was like, hey, I'm talking to you. How come you can't understand? And it was just garbled. And it was just, I would just like equate that to, um, we hear the radio station, we hear the song, but then it goes off and get a little static. You couldn't quite understand. So his speech was delayed, um, even though he was communicating in his own way. And it was frustrating for him because he was, you know, would just have the meltdown and he would just get overwhelmed. Um, it took a very long time to try to figure out what was going on and then, you know, test after test after test. Um, he fell into the PDD and OS, the um, persuasive. Um, persuasive. <laughs> Thank you. Um, not, uh, not otherwise specified. It was like, well, he's not really, like he was just there on the edge. So he had some of the characteristics, but not, you know, others. I'm like, well, there's something going on. So what do we do? So, you know, I just immediately jumped into we're going to do intervention and I didn't care if it was a label. So whatever it took the, to, you know, and I think that's one of those things that being a black parent in the community, you don't want to have to deal with the whole labeling thing. And I think we don't think about just past. It's not a label. It's you're trying to get the services. Yeah. So whatever you need to do to get those services, you know, are, are, Caucasian moms and dads, you know, they're going to do and say and hey and put every slap every label they want to, but they're going to get these services. So I kind of thought past that and got, you know, it's I still kind of deal with, is he going to be stigmatized? Yes. I think that's just coming from one, you're black, mm -hmm. two, you're male. Yeah. You already yeah. got two strikes against you. Mm -hmm. So, okay, we got this other thing. We're gonna not gonna let those those you know those other things hinder us from living, and you know you're gonna be the best human that you can be. So you have autism, it's okay. And so I've always just made him feel comfortable. And at a, you know when he got older and was able to understand some things, introduced him to what was going on. Hey, you think a little differently than everyone else. Your brain is wired differently that does not make you less you can do things that other people can't do and certain things that you know other people can so you know don't think that as a crutch where you're hindering yourself just because you're autistic and don't let anybody tell you that you're less than because you think differently than they do so i've always built up you know his self-esteem and you know, just really kind of push him out of his comfort zone. My son is, he's kind of like an old man. He's like happy that we're at quarantine. He's like, oh, I gotta go to school and, you know, but he does miss his friends. He is social. Um, he has a, a, a small, very small cluster of friends. Um, so I was kind of worried about that, you know, having a diagnosis of, of autism, like, oh my God, he's not going to be social and you know, he's going to have a hard time making friends and that whole bullying thing, you know, but uh, Pete, so, I Lat had a Latanya, social I wanted to, to mm -hmm. um, what, as a parent, as a mother, um, I have a seven-year-old who um, is, is not autistic, but she has ADHD. Um, and Oh, speaking of that, sometimes, and you guys didn't mention that, it comes with an extra special power. He has ADD too, ADHD as well. So we got two powers. I call right. special powers. They're real interesting. <laughs> Absolutely. So <laughs> that, that alone for me has been an incredible struggle. And I know autism presents its own different, unique scenarios. As a parent, what is it like you, both you and Maria, when you one had to um, embrace and accept that your child was a little bit different? What are some of the emotions that you go through and that you feel and any frustrations that you had for and and for me like as a parent just dealing with adhd i have moments where i honestly feel like angry and like i'm gonna lose it and 
and and and it's not that I'm necessarily angry. I get angry at her, but I also get frustrated. And I think about: Was there anything that maybe I did wrong within my pregnancy? Was there something that I could have done differently? Is there or God? Like I sometimes I get so frustrated where it's like I, I oftentimes may even wish that I didn't even have a child at times. Like, what are some of those? Um, have you ever had any of those? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> I'm gonna address that the anger part. Um, I think I felt like autism stole my child sometimes. I mean, I really struggle some days with the things that come along with that. You know, I'm, I'm a single parent, um, divorced. His dad lives in a different state. But even with all of that, I keep our stress level, you know, such as it is, you know, I keep it even, it even. So when I get frustrated, I try not to take it out on him. And I try to recognize when I'm frustrated with the things the, that he's either dealing with. Um, and it doesn't always work. Now, it get ugly up in here. I ain't going to lie. Like, we in here yelling, fussing, and cussing. I, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm just being real. You know, it, it's, it's tough. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I've learned to um, empathize with him and understand okay, you're having a hard, recognize what it is, you're having a hard time processing. Okay, you didn't process what I said. So instead of me getting angry that I, I had to repeat myself five times, okay, maybe what I said was too many steps. So let me break it down. And those are, you know, little tips and tricks. And I had to learn this along the way. I had to go to therapy. Um, you know, I, I, I mean, there are things that I had to do along the way to cope and work through my own sense of loss you know because I, I feel like like i said i feel like it stole my child like i see all these wonderful great things it's still great mm -hmm. but like what if we didn't have these things to deal with you know what could what could mm -hmm. be mm -hmm. so those are things i think i struggle with the other thing is i had to get over like i said the whole label thing and you know how it is with your family, with, with our culture, how we raise our kids, how we may have come up. That didn't always work for me. And I had to get over what you learn, you're going to have to unlearn because he's different. Mm -hmm. And, you know, time out actually worked for me as opposed to spanking. Well, I, I you know, put the, yeah, I would. <laughs> Listen, black you them pause on. Maria, Maria, jump in and, and Maria, jump in and, and talk to us about, you know, some of those feelings that you went through as well. So for me, I think it's, um, I, you know, I always tell my clients and anybody I talk to, I think it's different because I am a therapist. So my background, you know, is uh, completely different. I'm always coming from that, um, that gray area. Uh, so for me, um, I knew at six months my daughter was autistic. Um, and I told my husband, my husband is actually a physician. He's an internist, um, but he's also Haitian. <laughs> um, and so he was like, ain't nothing wrong with him. There ain't nothing wrong with her. His exact words when I came to him at six months and said, you know, I think uh, Malia's autistic. He was like, you diagnose your clients, don't diagnose my kid. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and then at, tw at 10 months, I, I just, I was like, okay, this is, I see everything now, you know, so I actually just went ahead and went through all the testing and he got on board. Um, did that cause a rift in, in, in you guys' relationship? It, it, did, it did not, um, because I think for him, once he started thinking medically from his medical side, um, he got immediately got on board and he was he's always but he does let, let me take the lead um he will say she is the expert i am the dad uh so you talk to her um i'm just here for support um so for me i never had any feelings of um, sadness around her being autistic my thing was mostly around the world not having her navigate the world she's black she's a girl and now she's autistic and now we have to not only teach her how to live as a, as a black girl in this world we have to teach her how to live as a black autistic 
girl in this world. Um, so for, for us, I think that's where we had the most difficulty. Um, a lot of times people think that girls do not have autism. They think that, you know, Malia is a unicorn <laughs> and she's not. There are many girls who are autistic. Um, it just presents itself differently sometimes in females. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we don't, we don't have any behavior issues with Malia. She is actually overly compliant and that is my issue. She's a people pleaser. Um, so that is my issue. She's no behavior issues. Um, we have four year old. Oh, can we switch? <laughs> Look, I have four mine is not kids. like that. Let me tell you, I think he's he, he's going to be the great debater. No, I'm like, yeah, dude, right. do we have to go back and forth on everything? No, <laughs> I mean he's got to plead very, his very case. Client. No, but we do have four year old twins, boy girl twins, and they give us like it's. It's they are off the chain, so wow. So, <laughs> Dr. Dr. T, Dr. T, when you um have patients who um may be dealing with autism or just even um as a psychiatrist in general, and you may hear you know a parent who is dealing with a variety of different issues with their child or just trying to understand it themselves, you know, what are some some tools or techniques that you would give and and for example, as I mentioned, like I sometimes deal with with a intense anger and frustration dealing with my mm -hmm. daughter, the issues that I'm having and, and trying to cope and be calm and things like that. Or someone who just refuses to believe that maybe there's something wrong. Like what, what's some things that you would say from that medical perspective? Um, I think, you know, the things that these ladies have said, the earlier you start treatment, the better the long-term prognosis is. So it helps for you to be open. Um, a lot of parents, especially in our community, it's almost like, you know, we don't want anything to be wrong with our children. Of course, we all have enough burden to bear being black, male or female. Um, and so it can be very difficult for black families to even just acknowledge, they're like, oh, she just needs to do this or that's nothing wrong with that, especially because there is such a wide spectrum. Uh, for autism and the types of the symptoms and things that it can present as. So some children can be very, very bright and they just really struggle with, you know, social interaction and they have trouble making friends. Some children can not even be able to feed themselves. And so it's the whole spectrum. So when parents have an idea of what they think autism looks like and their child doesn't look like that, it can be very hard for them to kind of accept the diagnosis and then accept treatment. Most of the treatments for autism are therapeutic. So there's occupational therapy, there's speech therapy, there's group therapy, there's all different kinds of therapies. Medication is really a last resort um, and only targets problematic behaviors. It doesn't cure the, the, the autism spectrum disorder. So most of the time we're really talking to the parents about going to the therapy, being consistent, getting the support at school. It is so difficult to get the support that you need at school and many parents give up. They don't wanna be seen as the problem parent, as the pushy parent. And in the end, what happens is their child suffers because the school is required to provide whatever your child needs to get an appropriate education. But quite frankly, and you know, forgive me all my friends in the educational world, but quite frankly, schools don't wanna do it. It costs money. <laughs> It exactly. costs to get those kind of experts in the school. Yeah. And so the schools would prefer that your child not be diagnosed and they would prefer not to give your child those services. So if you um, are not persistent and push, 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 the school will be like, okay, no problems. We'll just put them in a regular classroom and let them fail year after year after year. So, so it's not really my child. Child. I was going to, I was going <laughs> to say the, <laughs> I was gonna say I'm that that squeaky wheel parent, but mm -hmm. I'm really nice. Mm -hmm. However, I'm going to be in your inbox mm -hmm. on a regular basis, and you're going to get an email from me almost daily mm -hmm. because of that very thing. One, I know it's a lot of paperwork. One, I know you know you're tied to the with the red tape and all the other stuff. However, this is my child, and I have a duty to do right by him and make sure that you do right. One, because my tax dollars pay your salary yeah. <laughs> in the county. 
-hmm. and you gonna do. Yeah. So we gonna work together, and I'm gonna be that parent that comes in from the jump, introducing myself as, "Hey, I'm Miles' mom." You know, I'll even give a rundown. Hey, you don't have the IEP. You didn't get a chance to read it. Here's a copy. Here's some at a glance. What type of person? Like you get an introduction for both of us of who I am, who he is you know, from day one. And then we go from there. So many parents, I recommend that they get, get someone like you, a parent advocate who's been through it, mm -hmm. because many parents, you know, may not have the fortitude to stand up to a school. And, you know, if they're scared, if they're uncomfortable, if they're questioning themselves, they're like, well, the school's the expert. So if they say it, then I'll just back off. And so I tell parents, get a parent advocate to work with you, to coach you, to help you stand up when you're feeling weak. If you need to take them to the meetings with you, do yeah. whatever it is, because your child only gets one chance at this day. Mm -hmm. And so you, I will agree with that. Um, in addition to my training as a licensed therapist, I'm also a special education advocate for parents. Mm -hmm. um, and what the parents don't realize is that um, there's a difference between a medical diagnosis and a school categorization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When um, your child is going through the school system and they give them a category, it is not a, a medical diagnosis. It's only good for the school. Mm -hmm. um, it does not get them services out of school. Um, so I think parents don't know their rights. Mm -hmm. um, they don't know the law. They don't know there's a complete law out there mm -hmm. um, for them and their child. Uh, so I think a lot of times schools depend on parents not knowing this and they take advantage of it. So um, Maria, like if I see, I'm listening to this show and I'm like, okay, everything y'all talking about is my kid. My kid is like four what like where do i start what's my roadmap to the what is it, the medical diagnosis versus the school support like where do i start i wouldn't even know where to start so for i started at at four at four years old well, three and a half with miles um i actually went to i had a, a nurse friend that was a pediatric nurse and he referred me to a child psychiatrist at georgetown um University Hospital. So I happened to go that route and then he got an initial, you know, review or, or not even diagnosis, but he was just seen by a medical doctor first and then he referred me to child find mm -hmm. in the county. So then I went to the school. So mine started from doctor to child find and then we went from there. Okay. So it just, from there, it just, I had to keep pressing like, hey, there's still something going on. I didn't have an actual diagnosis, but I had started the process and it didn't necessarily what is start at the find? school first. It's a government-funded um, program. Every, every state has it. Um, it's for ages three and up. Uh, before three, in Florida, it's called early steps. Uh, different states call it different things. So Malia actually started in early steps. We went to our pediatrician first. She was not um, on accord with me thinking that Malia was autistic. <laughs> and she uh, referred us to early steps. Um, and when you go to this testing, uh, there's a developmental pediatrician, there's an OT, which is an occupational therapist, there's an SLP, which is a speech and language pathologist, um, there is a child uh, psychologist in there. So they're all in there looking for developmental milestones on your child. They even talk to you as the parent. Um, so after she went through that, they said, oh yes, you know, Mrs. Davis Pierre, we agree, we think she is autistic, but because she's not three, um, we don't want to give her this diagnosis. Um, so we, they referred us to a um, child neurologist, which, you know, they are very rare. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, luckily, you know, um, I always tell, tell my clients, I come from a place of privilege, um, being that I am a therapist and being that my husband is a physician. You know, we went to the child neurologist. Our insurance didn't cover any of those expensive and expensive tests that mm -hmm. we had to actually um, wow. go through. And we're talking about tests that um, we would have known at that time at her being 12 months, 
if she had these things that they were looking for, we would already known, uh, but they had to rule out. Um, so we had to do those tests and we had to pay out of pocket thousands of dollars for these tests um, to get it. And he also agreed after getting these very expensive and extensive tests that Malia <laughs> was indeed autistic, but he wanted to wait another year and a half. And at that point, I was just completely frustrated because I know you know, early intervention matters. So I actually sat in his office for a week. Um, and what you, hold up. what you mean sat in his office? I what you mean you have to do? Yes. You had to be on him. I sat in his, I said, okay. Mm -hmm. When he said that, I said, okay, that's fine. I'm going to sit in your waiting room um, until you give me this diagnosis. Yeah. I'm going to greet your uh, receptionist. I'm going to greet you. We'll have coffee. We'll have lunch. And I will see you at the end of the day and say goodbye. He did not take me seriously. I sat in there for a week. Um, he gave me that. <laughs> he gave Wait, me this that. is your husband, right? No, this was oh. a, this was, no, no, this was a neurologist. <laughs> Yeah, he wouldn't even listen to the neurologist. Okay, hey, you gotta come home after you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Wait, now, wait. does it matter? Was he was he black or white, or does it? It was just a, he was white, and we sat in there. Uh, well, I sat in there for a week, and he finally at the end he was like, you know, here take take her diagnosis <laughs> paperwork and and be on your way. And well, that let me say this because I think that. You know, you ladies are demonstrating such fortitude. Mm -hmm. And so I want to summarize it in, in this way. There are two uh, national programs, but each state administers it differently um, that can help any child with issues um, around their development or their growth, uh, around their general health. They oftentimes come through the state's Department of Public Health but it could come through other departments as well. And so the first one is zero to three, and it's usually called early something, <laughs> early intervention, early steps, something. And that's to help um, children, and we have no idea what the diagnosis when children come through this door, but children between the age of zero to three, because we know that's such a critical neurodevelopmental time that we wanna get them diagnosed and treated early. Um, but many people don't know about these services, it's always a long wait, no matter what state you live in. Um, and it's, again, is it, I don't want to say it's a tactic to discourage people, but it certainly is a hurdle that limits people's access to really, really needed services. And then the thing is, these things don't end at the age of three. And so for a long mm -hmm. time, there was a big gap between three and five, because at five, it gets picked up in the school system. And so kids would get great services between zero to three, and then they might get great services at five, but between three and five, they were just falling through the cracks. So the, the, the second program for three to five-year-olds or three to six-year-olds, depending on the state, was developed to keep catching kids and helping identify and make diagnosis and get them services before they got to the school system. So if you think about it, by the time your child is six, they may have been through three different systems of services just to get what they need. That takes a lot for a child, for a parent, um, but it is out there. And so we want people to know that you can start with your primary care doctor, their, your pediatrician. They should know about these things. And even if they don't agree with you, like for Maria, they should refer you to it. If not, call the state department of public health or your county department of public health and ask them, how do I get my young child evaluated? Um, and every state has some system in place to provide that kind of assessment. Yes, yes. And um, I think it's also good for parents to know that while you're in these programs, so for instance, when Malia started in child, um, early steps and then was transferred to child fine, um, she had many therapists, so the, um, turnaround for your therapist is, is it, it's high um and with mm -hmm. me i just wasn't accepting any old therapist anyway if you came in my house and you didn't know anything about you know taking culture into consideration you had to go because um in speak to that culture, though when you say that when you when you because there's a lot of listeners black listeners who will who don't understand that or who don't know what to look for when you say that so what's what would be something that you should expect when you say, I want someone who understands culturally? So this is, uh, for me, um, 
I'll give you a couple examples of therapists I work with. So when um, my son is getting services, he's not autistic, but he's getting services now. When I was filling out the paperwork, one of the questions were, um, are there any cultural tradition or uh, cultural things that happen in your home we should be aware of? That is already letting me know that you're gonna take that into consideration. A lot of therapists, will come in your home and uh, just do what they know in school. They will apply the interventions and think they work for everybody the same. But what and, if I say my cultural tradition is that I'm black? And that is a cultural tradition. <laughs> when I tell you, when they came in the house and they just thought that, um, for instance, if you see my shoes by the door and you just come in my house, and you don't take your shoes off and you walking all around in my house in your shoes, I'm like, you didn't see the shoes at the door. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I just know. So, I've been I've been a little I've been a little blessed. I call it divine intervention, because like I said, I'm a single parent and everything that I've ever needed or where to go has been placed before me through somebody. I fell into it or just you know, like being, you know, persistent. So those that have come to the house, like they've actually taken their shoes off at the door. So I was like, oh, I didn't have to tell you. you, you asked because you saw it there. So, or, you know, they would ask about, you know, Miles's, um, you know, his um, interests and, you know, just his temperament and things of that nature and kind of take into account how we do things. But then too, I, I would say that I'm pushy a little bit and I'm just gonna tell you how we do things. Well, so I you can gonna tell. get acclimated at we the door can tell. about how the culture <laughs> is at the Ward family home. But you and know you I'm gonna know the next time you come that. how the culture is when you come over here and then we're gonna be all right. And then if you didn't get the first time, we're gonna make sure you get the second and the third and then we're gonna be all right. And then if not then we'll make other arrangements. And, you know, so a lot of people are not like that. Um, you know, I know you guys can attest to in the Black community, therapy is not something that we are um, readily wanting to do. <laughs> you know, yeah. so um, when therapists are coming, even for me as a therapist, with therapists coming in my home, I'm already on guard because mm. um, I know the history of how it is mm. for therapists coming into black people homes okay you know we're like you know we can't really be truthful and honest with you because look you might be trying to take my kid <laughs> so that so maria I have, I have a question for you mm -hmm. as um you're a therapist and mom do you go to therapy yourself just yes. to you know get it off your chest you know what i mean just i mean you're you're doing that that's your profession yes and i i ha i'm a therapist with a therapist because i need my time and my self-care too <laughs> so i always especially now with these kids at home all day let me tell you my therapist <laughs> sick of me <laughs> but yes I, I make it a point to um to to you know make sure that's a part of my self-care so I'm a big advocate mm -hmm. on parents making sure that they are taking care of self um mm -hmm. have a really bad idea of what self-care is we see people on Instagram on the beach with their Mai Tais chilling and all of that <laughs> that is not what I promote self-care as it's about your mental health and your your physical health your spiritual health mm -hmm. you know taking care of all of that Speaking so of getting vacation, my nails done is not ahead, self care. So getting my nails done is not nails? self care. That is self care. <laughs> it is. That is self care. Yes. Um, getting your nails done. If, if you getting your nails done, yeah. but you're not yeah. taking care of your mental health as well, that's a, you're not going to be fulfilled. So if I'm just you know going around and taking vacations, getting away from stuff, and not actually dealing with the stuff that I am running away from, when I'm done with that vacation, guess what? It's waiting for me when I open the door. Well, I just go on another vacation. That's how. I <laughs> <laughs> but but no. Speaking of vacations, um, are there any um 
the word just left my mind, but is there is there anything special that you have to do when you want to do things as a family or as a unit, having an autistic child? So like, it's going to the grocery store, it's going to a vacation, it's going to wherever different than what it may be with what we may deem as something normal. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it, <laughs> it definitely is, but we are avid vacationers. We, we are going on our vacation. You know, autism is not going to stop us from going on a vacation. I don't care how you other people may feel about my child. We're going to go on vacation. Yeah. Too. We, um, we but, travel. We definitely, we definitely travel. I have to say, um, now when you mentioned just going to regular stuff, like the grocery store, that used to be traumatic for me because miles would have complete meltdowns. I don't know what it was. He's about three, four years old. Going to the grocery store was just horrible. It got better over time. And so now he doesn't even want to, you know, be bothered. Teenager. He's like, yeah, but you're going to get these groceries out the car. So, <laughs> but as far as traveling, I do have to take some prep, you know, I have to prep. So I can't like surprise him. I did that one time too. I took him to the circus we had been to the circus before and he was like three years old and oh I'm you know I'll take you to the circus and it just did not go well the noise or whatever he just had a complete meltdown it was awful so I've learned not to I have to give him notice you know so when we're going on a trip I kind of have to plan it close to it and then tell him if I tell him too soon and it's like oh my god I'm gonna hear about it until the day we go mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. the take for instance we went to Disney World last last summer and that was a surprise and um to make it fun I did a scavenger hunt a real easy one so he was able to go along with that and I was still able to have some fun with him and and provide you know hey we're going on a trip traveling has never really been a big deal because I've been traveling with him since he was two um, on the plane, he seemed to like that. The noise and the vibrations didn't really bother him that much. Um, I would just have his toys or stem, you know, things to make him feel comfortable. But I think that preparation of having the things that he needs to comfort himself, um, now that he's a little older, just kind of telling him ahead of time what to expect. That transition was a, a big deal. Um, it's not such a big deal as when he was younger. So transitioning from one thing to the next isn't as a, you know it doesn't fall out in the you know on the floor and have you know just a complete meltdown like he did when he was little but just giving him you know notice hey we're going to do um we're going on a trip well where are we going we're going to florida we're leaving early in the morning so you're going to have to you know get yourself prepared this is what we're going to pack um get him involved in where we're going so for disney we went to disney world what I did was um, uh, watch YouTube videos. And I don't know if that was a good thing or not, because then he got hooked on them and he was watching them every day. I'm like, oh my God. Oh. But the good thing about it is that there, was, uh, there were a couple of bloggers that went through like a tour. So you can kind of go through the experience of what it's going to be like. And that gave him an idea of, hey, this is what we're doing. He got excited. And when it came time and we were able to experience it, he had kind of already been there because we had been watching videos. Now, the other good thing about going to Disney in particular is that they have a full range of disability and programs and things like that, accommodations for those who are coming to visit the park. And um, I researched all of that and called ahead of time found out what to do. So when I got there, it was very seamless, you know, set it all up, get the fast pass, get the extra fast pass so we can go past the first fast pass. And, you know, cause he doesn't like waiting in line. Yeah. So it just made our trip, even though it was very quick, two, three days, very enjoyable for us. Um, the crowds didn't seem to bother him, the walking did, but you know, the overall experience was just one that he could remember. And then another one was going on a cruise, which we probably not gonna do for a while. No. <laughs> well, let me let me inter let me inter <laughs> interject, Latanya, because um, we're, we're getting ready to close out. Dr. T, can oh. you step in and and speak to any? Is there anything that we should also be mindful of 
in dealing with our children, black children having autism, dealing with anything in general, is, is there certain characteristics that we should be um, just mindful of that's different from what white children may experience? And I don't know if I'm, I'm framing the question correctly because I'm not trying to say that a white child being autistic versus a black child is so different, but I know that our experience in this world is different. And so as a medical professional, how do we deal with that and help others as black families deal with that. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And and I would say, I think that as I think about the black families versus the white families that I've worked with and children with autism, I think that black families, whether they kind of admit it or acknowledge it up front, or if it takes them years, there is a kind of grieving because we are a very social culture, right? you're going to hug everybody that comes in that front door. Well, that could be like impossible for a child with autism. So that means you have to change your perspective as a black parent about what you expect from your child. And that means that you kind of need to grieve and let that go so that you can support your child to become all that they can become, right? As long as you're holding on to wishing that they were something else, you can't support them to become what they're capable of becoming. And so I think we also, because we do walk around the world and we know that there are perceptions of us when children with autism have behaviors that look different to the outside world, I think that's, it's hard for all parents and it's hard for white parents, but I think it's extremely hard for black parents because you know people are already judging our children. They're already judging us. They already have ideas about who we are as a people. So when our child is throwing themselves on the floor in the store, it's feeding into somebody's um, okay. somebody's stereotype. They right? might call the police because exactly. like, we're talking about like children, but like they're going to become adults at some point. So like, what resources are there? What should I teach my child to do? Should they be telling people, look, I'm autistic off break because nobody's going to look at a black child and or a six foot black man mm -hmm. that might you know at 24 who's having a fit and they're not gonna think this is a person in need of support um, or you know that they're having some kind of a capacity I think it, it, it's um on the level of your child's comprehension as well yeah, um, because if that. my child for instance malia is seven now almost eight um and although we are very open about her being autistic she doesn't quite have the comprehension to be able to know she's autistic yeah. um, and verbalize that. Um, but I think black parents have to be mindful, you know, as, as we are, are black women on this call, we know that when we go in public, we do have to, to be a certain way. And it's just because we are black, you know, and a lot of times I think we have to explain that to parents, my black son, um, falling out in, in public and doing certain things is not going to have the same response as a white child doing those things, mm -hmm. um, regardless if my child has, you know, a diagnosis or not. It's mm -hmm. still not going to be perceived the same way, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to be different. Black parents have to take that into consideration when they're thinking about um, therapies and things for their kids because, you know, it's just not going to be perceived the same way. Um, you know, there, it, it's just not. And, and for Black parents, our experiences are completely different. You know, um, my worst fear is my child being shot and killed um, because she is not going to be, even be given the chance to process and say something because she needs some time to be able to respond to your questions. So when she comes into contact with a police officer and she is doing things that are, because she is autistic, flapping her hands, moving strangely, not being able to stop uh, because they want her to stop, uh, not mm -hmm. being able to say her name right when they want her to say her name. Um, my my thought is, oh, now she's going to be hurt. Um, white parents don't necessarily have that same uh, fear. Um, so, uh, you know, that's why I made it a point to make a space for Black parents because we are so different from 
the worries that white parents have. And a lot of times when we go in spaces that are mixed, we feel the need not to be able to express our, our, what our worst fears are because they're worrying about something that, you know, in our mind seems trivial. And now, as a, from a political, I'm sorry, Dr. Worst. I would say kind of in, in response to Sasha's question and also as a kind of wrap up for my portion, the one thing I would say to black parents um, and, and that I think goes against our culture um, is you need a team of mm -hmm. professionals to help you. Mm -hmm. You cannot do this alone. And you're going to have to let people in your business. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> so we are, you, you know, we are used to protecting ourselves mm -hmm. because we haven't always been treated fairly or kindly in the health situation, in the educational setting, in, 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 in every setting. But if your child has a, an autistic spectrum disorder, you are going to need a team of people that you tell the truth to in mm -hmm. order for your child to get what they need. So you're going to have to figure out how to mm -hmm. consistently let down your guard and tell people your business and then advocate very, very, very strongly to push forward and the culture is important because you're going to tell them stuff and they're going to miss it and you got to help correct them but you got to work with the people that you got in in a perfect world we would all have culturally competent occupational therapists speech and language therapists teacher every year of the school year every music teacher that you but that's just not going to happen so you have to be ready to tell the truth and then advocate for your kid but you're going to need a team and you're going to have to let people in your business I have to agree with you, um, Dr. Royster. That's definitely when I said earlier that divine intervention has helped me along the way, having a team of folks, um, not always family. Mm -hmm. You know, I have very close friends, sorority sisters, and I have to say I've leaned heavily on my sister, you know, the sisterhood to, um, to assist me in, in various capacities. Um, I've had really good tutors for a number of years and, and therapists and things like that, not only for myself, but for my son, you know, so I definitely echo what you're saying that I, I know I couldn't do this alone. I'd be crazy, um, you know, ready to pull my hair out without a team of people um, to assist. So, yeah, and I, I would just like to add um, that uh, parents need to be okay with advocating, um, mm -hmm. especially Black parents, because we are taught not to challenge authority. Um, so, you know, challenging healthcare professionals, you know, we're not taught to do that. And a lot of times you need to, to be able to do that in some instances. It's okay to seek other opinions. It's okay to fire people off your team and get the right team players um, because it's so important to have a collaborative team. You know, if somebody on my team is not working collaboratively and they're holding my kid back, I need to, ha I have to replace them. You know, even if that means firing me as a therapist, getting a new physician, um, getting a new OT, you have to be able to do those things for the success of your child, and you have to be okay with that. Um, you know, the, yes, to a certain degree, I'm going to educate and teach, but when I see that you just don't care to get it, um, then I need to be able to get somebody who is going to get it, um, because it, mean, it means everything to my child and their success. So a lot of times I tell parents that you have to be okay with firing people, getting other people on your team and relying on a support circle. And a lot of times that may not be family because a lot of times they don't understand because they, they're not going through it. If I say to my family, oh, you know, I had Malia's IEP meeting today, they're not gonna quite understand what that meant. If I talk to another parent who knows and has been through IEP meetings, then I'm like, okay, girl, what, what you need, a bottle, a wine? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, they get it. And a lot of times, you know, that's good because we don't have to explain why we need that bottle of wine. We just have mm -hmm. that support. Mm -hmm. And so you have to get people in your circle who understand what you're going through so you don't have to constantly explain why you're feeling the way you feel. Right. 
Are there things from a policy standpoint that we should be pushing or advocating in the support space for folks with autism or any type of a spectrum or cognitive um, or difference? Because I know like in the state of Maryland um, right now on the House floor is a bill, I believe it's 1070 um, from Monique Johnson in Prince George's County, who's pushing to have training for first responders, um, social workers, police and fire who may come in contact with folks with different spectrums of disorders so that I may see a 25 year old six foot three black man and I may be able to eat more easily recognize okay there is a cognitive or processing disorder so that like you said your daughter is going to need some time to comply where we know in our communities you don't get time to comply. No, not um, at all. So what should we be advocating for those that do or don't have children, but from a po policy standpoint, what should we be pushing in our state houses and our local you, you know, municipalities around how to support these families and our children? I think um, definitely the first responder training, um, definitely first responder training, um, paraprofessional training, teacher trainings, Mm -hmm. um, it, it has to be a collaborative effort because not all of the trainings are happening at the same time on the same levels and it's a little spotty. So if it's, you know, you level the playing field and everybody, you know, is like that team, the village is trained and trained on the same things. Um, I think that we can definitely start there. Um, putting together or putting forward more resources for parent supports um putting it out there i think a, a full campaign and um a communication for on the local level so parents know where to get the supports i think that's part of you know some of the issues is that parents don't even know where to go mm -hmm. um where to who to who to go to where to start um you know it's out there but just breaking it down sometimes you get an avalanche of so much information to read you don't even know what to process yourself so i think those types of supports are are necessary and if we could legislate i don't know if ne legislating that would help but putting the resources you know where the funding is to pour into the community so you know parents can can have that yeah and um for me, it's all about healthcare professionals being culturally responsive. Um, a lot, I know for therapists, you know, we think we take one culturally competence course and we're just culturally competent forever. Um, and that is not the case. I am a black woman and I am not culturally responsive for all black people. I don't know about all black people. <laughs> so I think that's important to know that we have to continue to train ourselves. Um, and as well as to know that, um, there's a gap in, in the black community. There's a gap between a black child getting diagnosed and a white child getting diagnosed. The information doesn't get to our communities in the same way it gets to the white communities. Um, so I'm a big advocate on going into black communities and explaining what autism actually is. You know, as we say, it is Autism you know, Awareness and Acceptance Month and actually autistic groups are, you know, uh, championing towards it being autism acceptance month um, and dropping the awareness but in the black mm -hmm. communities um, we don't have the awareness and you have to be aware of something to be able to accept something so um, for me it's always autism awareness and acceptance my parents are from a small town in Brundage and I can tell you uh, in Alabama called Brundage and I can tell you those people do not know what autism is um, you know, and in our communities, we hear the word autism, we think of intellectual disability, you know, and it's not the same thing. Can a person who is autistic have an intellectual disability? Yes, they can. Um, but we hear the word autism and it becomes a big, scary monster. And a lot of that is because we don't know exactly what it is because we don't get the information to our community. And when the information comes to our community, when it's not presented by people who understand us and know us, um, a lot of times we already have our defenses up, you know, so that's why I'm a big champion for people who look like us to go into our communities and advocate for us. All right, absolutely. This was an incredible show. Dr. T, is there any last words you want to you wanna leave? 
Um, and now I would only say that these ladies are a wonderful example of resources that are available in the community. Other parents that have been before are willing to show you the way. And so don't be afraid to ask for support. It takes a village, literally and figuratively, um, to raise our children. Absolutely. Star, what about you? Y'all, y'all, I mean, I don't have kids. So again, you know, but y'all are so amazing. I think the biggest thing is that, you know, to, to be resilient and, and push for what you need. That's the biggest thing I took from both of you ladies that you are pushing to get the services your kids need. And I piggyback on Dr. Royster because I always have two things. Uh, <laughs> the roadmap, you know, there are people who've gone before you. Don't re You don't have to recreate the wheel. Reach out to these ladies reach out to people in your community, share what's going on. Dr. Rush, you talked about, you know, we got to tell our business so people can help us because like, I'll be honest, like Latanya, I've met your son and I did not know until I was like, oh, she's the autism person for Zeta that he was autistic. I literally was like, oh, he's just a teenager. So if you share, then that can help someone or you know I could be sitting at home with an autistic child and and not even know that you're my resource and my soul are sitting right next to me so yeah absolutely that's good ladies again thank you all I guess I'd say um my two cents leaving off is is just to piggyback on a few things is one like Dr. Royster said you know we do have to share our business um as I had explained earlier dealing with my own issues with my own child um, I also had to get over the concept of I would always strategically try to find a black doctor for everything and Dr. T has really helped us understand that some that there aren't really enough black doctors for everything um, yes. so i sometimes will go in with the thought well okay well this white doctor are they going to do this are they going to understand are they going to care but sharing my business and something that i've learned from star and believing that there are people who want to help you um you know has really helped in receiving the people have, who have helped me um johns hopkins was an incredible hospital we were on the waiting list for a year um, but I went in, it was this middle-aged white guy and I, you know, summed him up and was like, uh, another meeting with someone. And it literally, as he started talking, he read my daughter's results and, and I, I, I started to cry because for the, it was like for the first time a doctor really understood and was able to convey what I had been experiencing and the frustration I had as a parent. And so I say that to say that there are people out here who are willing to help who, you know, just because they might not understand black culture, they understand the diagnosis and that they can help you with other resources. And again, as Star mentioned, these ladies will be incredible resources. We'll be sharing the information as we upload. Follow us, American Therapy with a K, Instagram, YouTube, all that. And we thank you all for being a part of the show and we out.